If religion is to be believed, the idea of crime has existed from the time humanity began. And when there's crime, there are punishments. Today, we have come a long way from the time of antiquity when an eye for an eye justice prevailed to modern prisons in Scandinavian countries where the emphasis is to make prison life normal and help people acclimatize. But how bad was it back in ancient times? Welcome to Nutty History. Today, we're going to look at what life was like in the scariest prisons in history. The City with No Nose Ancient Greek historian Diodorus Siculus and geographer Strabo told the tale of a city that was located near Gaza, where the modern city of El Arish is today. The story of this ancient place sounds like Lovecraftian horror, a stronghold made of stone walls that were nearly 70 feet high and about 1,700 feet long. The citizens of this gloomy city were all men who had separate noses, and they were not allowed to leave. The Greeks called this city in their legends Rhinocolura. Not only Greeks, but Romans and Jews mentioned this city in their stories as well. For a long time, historians dismissed the existence of this city as a myth, but in the 1880s, archaeologists found that the city not only existed, but once surely was home to noseless citizens, or maybe we should say prisoners. Yes, the citizens of this city were no ordinary men. They were criminals. They were, in fact, branded criminals who could be identified by their severed noses. Rhinocolora was no ordinary city, but it was a grand prison at the edge of the desert to house people who have committed crimes in the Egyptian kingdom. Life in this prison city was brutal, mind-boggling, and perhaps worse than a death sentence. There was not a single drop of fresh water available anywhere in the city, and people were forced to either drink from polluted wells or filter the salty water from the sea. For food there, the only options were catching fish in the sea with reed nets and hunting a few quails that would fly by. There is a dispute over who built Rhinocolora, but most of the sources point to a foreign king, Actasanus, an Ethiopian king who conquered ancient Egypt in 500 BC, was said to be a stickler for law and order. He allegedly held mass criminal trials of defendants from all over the realm. Those who were found guilty in these large-scale prosecutions did not face execution after their trials. Instead, they had their noses chopped, and some had their ears as well before being sent to Taru, the presumed Egyptian name for Rhinocolora. However, the discovery of a stone slab outlining the laws of a pharaoh who ruled between 1321 to 1293 BC proposed that the city was even older and built around 1300 BC during the Golden Age of Ancient Egypt. Experts believe that Harimib, the pharaoh who overthrew the 18th dynasty, must have built Taru. During this period, People were terminated for insignificant crimes such as stealing bread, so being sent to this grotesque city to survive was considered an act of benevolence from the king. Sadly, the city must have been such an intimidating sight. It is stated that many prisoners took their own lives to avoid the punishment soon after arriving at Taru. Prisoners of Sea During the golden age of piracy, the sea belonged to no nation, but it did belong to the rowdy sailors who made their laws. The code is more what you'd call guidelines than actual rules. As they ravaged and looted the oceans, they didn't just rob ships of their treasures and stocks, but often crews as well. If any prisoners were taken alive, the captives would be put to work on the pirate ship. In particular, pirates would keep carpenters, map readers, or surgeons captive because they could use these types of prisoners as help on their ships. Any extra crew would be sold. If the ship hadn't immediately surrendered, the captain and other officers would often be forced to walk the plank. The Proclaimers of Horror There is not much Assyrian artwork surviving today, but what has, most of it offers a very common theme, violence and subjugation. After overthrowing the Hittites in 900 BC, the Assyrians became the biggest power and they craved more. The Assyrian society was not only prone to warmongering and cruelty, but they were proud of it. According to historian Arthur Farrell, the result of constant warring by Assyrians resulted in the establishment of many prisons of war camps that were similar in many ways to German concentration camps. 
Asher Badipal, who ruled from 669 BC to 631 BC, had a reputation as the worst of the Assyrian kings throughout history. Dismembering was a common occurrence in the Syrian POW camps, and lashing was served like meals every day. They portrayed these punishments to the sorry survivors of war in their art and culture. They also encouraged people and victims alike to sing tales of Assyrian tormenting skills to the enemy states. They wanted to advertise fear and tyranny as part of their psychological defense attacks. You know, often while moving, they would leave prisoners impaled to die a slow and agonizing death, not only to make them suffer, but to warn travelers and onlookers. They would also leave the skin of their dead prisoners hanging on the walls of the defeated cities. The cruelty didn't hurt only the enemies, the Assyrian soldiers suffered too. The soldiers would see and hear the ghosts of their enemies and prisoners. Vikings and their thralls For Vikings, sailing into the horizon meant freedom and hope, but for their victims, it was the stark opposite. I'm talking bleakness and servitude. Vikings made humans their most successful commodity, and they not only sold them off to make riches, but also brought them back home to make them their thralls. Interestingly, it was considered a massive insult for a Scandinavian in the Middle Ages to milk their cow, and they must have had a thrall for it. These thralls, or prisoners, endured a horrible life under the watching eyes of Vikings. Thralls were subjected to hard work and were meant to serve until their death. They were shouldered with a heavy and undesirable task on the farms, such as digging peat, chopping wood for ships, or watching over pigs. Female thralls had it worse and were exploited whenever Vikings desired. If thralls had children, they would also be considered thralls from birth. Thralls were also subjected to involuntary death when their masters died. Although this lifetime imprisonment didn't come with extra perks of physical punishment on its own, thralls were subject to extreme persecution and suffering if they disobeyed their masters. Beatings, starvation, amputations, branding with a hot iron, and even death could be served as punishments. Some historians argue that thralls who committed the gravest offenses could also be subjected to the infamous Blood Eagle ritual to make an example out of them, you know, so that they would serve as a warning to other thralls for what disobedience or revolt may cost them. Of course, Vikings never had a proper prison system, but for the thralls, the homes of their masters were nothing less than a prison itself. The Confinement of Confessions while most prisons were built and maintained for people who confessed or were convicted of a crime, the Placa del Rey in Barcelona once housed prisons where people were punished before they confessed their crimes. In the Middle Ages, several important buildings were established here. The Royal Palace, the Chapel St. Agata, and the seven-story King Martí Tower, the highest in medieval Barcelona. But the Inquisition's old prisons hosted ceremonies to execute defendants dressed in ridiculous tunics and pointed hats decorated with drawings that portrayed their imposed guilt. You know, it was common for Inquisition to use agonizing practices to extract a confession out of people accused of heretic crimes. Some Inquisitors used starvation, forced the accused to consume and hold vast quantities of water or other fluids, or heaped burning coals on parts of their bodies. But these methods didn't always work fast enough for their liking, so they decided to use crueler methods such as strapado. Over years, this form of torment developed many different versions, but one of the earliest methods would have the accused hands tied behind their back and a rope would be looped over a brace in the ceiling or attached to a pulley. The subject would then be raised until they were hanging by their arms. This was not only painful, but had a high probability of shoulders pulling out of their sockets. Weights could be added to ankles to make it an even more agonizing experience. Another popular method among the Inquisitors was the rack, where the subject had his hands and feet tied or chained to rollers at one or both ends of a wooden or metal frame. The Inquisitor turned the rollers with a handle, which pulled the chains or ropes in increments and stretched the subject's joints, often until they dislocated. Often, simply seeing someone else being punished on the rack was enough to make another person confess. You know, Inquisitors needed to extract a confession because they believed it was their duty to bring the accused back to their faith. A true confession resulted in the accused being forgiven, but he was usually still forced to absolve himself by performing penances, such as pilgrimages or wearing multiple heavy crosses. If the accused didn't confess, the Inquisitors could sentence him to life imprisonment. The Frozen Hell During the days of Joseph Stalin, one wrong word could end with the secret police at your door, ready to drag you off to a Soviet gulag, one of the many forced labor camps where inmates worked until they died. The Gulag prisoners could work up to 14 hours per day in well below freezing temperatures. 
Gulag authorities would force their prisoners to do exhausting physical work in the most extreme climates. Prisoners toiled cutting trees with hand saws and axes or shoveling dirt from the frozen ground as they dug with primitive shovels and pickaxes. Many people had to mine coal and copper with their bare hands as they inhaled ore dust and ended up suffering from lifelong painful lung disease, which often proved fatal as well. On top of everything else, these prisoners were malnourished. Historians estimate that nearly 14 million people were thrown into a gulag prison during Stalin's reign. These prisoners were responsible for the construction of the White Sea Baltic Sea Canal between 1931 and 1933. It was the first massive construction project of the gulag. Over 100,000 prisoners dug a 141-mile canal with few tools other than simple pickaxes, shovels, and makeshift wheelbarrows in just 20 months. Initially viewed as a great success and celebrated in a volume published both in the Soviet Union and the United States, the canal turned out to be too narrow and too shallow to carry most sea vessels. Many prisoners died during construction. Home of the Devil If you saw the Devil's Island, also called Ile du Diable, at the horizon from a ship, you may wonder why someone would name an island Devil's Island. I mean, it was a tropical paradise. But the abundance of palm trees and sparkling water that surrounds it cannot hide its horrible past. From 1852 to 1953, Devil's Island, which actually encompasses three islands off the coast of French Guiana and a slice of Cayenne, was hell on earth for French prisoners incarcerated there. The prisoners of Devil's Island could be guilty of heinous crimes or something as frivolous as offending Napoleon Bonaparte. And then some were wrongly accused, like Alfred Dreyfus. But irrespective of the severity of their crimes, they were all here to suffer without discrimination. The men imprisoned at Devil's Island endured rampant diseases, malnutrition, and mistreatment by guards. Few ever returned to France, and only two managed to escape on their own. Besides Papillon, whose attempt was immortalized in a movie, the only other inmate who successfully escaped was Clément Duval. Duval was a French anarchist who was arrested in France for robbing a mansion and stabbing a policeman in 1886. Do you think we missed any horrible prisons from history? Tell us in the comments below, and as always, thanks for watching Nutty History.